90 year celebration of the lovely Linden Seventh-day Adventist Church. 90 years of ministry, 90 years of being here. But why do we celebrate anniversaries? Uh, you don't know this, but it's been 30 years since I have been a part of the Linden Seventh-day Adventist Church. 30 years. I did the math, Dulcia. 30 years ago, showed up for choir rehearsal. I remembered it was um, Delroy, Abinna, Carl. They were the first ones in the tenor section. Well, tenor slash baritone. We were learning, I got the keys to the kingdom. Madanobi Wachuku said, Dillis, come to choir rehearsal. And I didn't want to go, but I came that day. And I didn't stop coming until 2002 when y'all sent us off to seminary. I remember going home and telling my mother, where is she? Mavis, Dowdy, there you are. I remember going home and saying, mommy, I joined the choir at De Manassas Church. And she can tell you, she said it was the beginning of the end. Because she couldn't understand. What you mean? You're not Adventist. I said, I know, they don't care. They said I could just join the choir. And we have spent 30 years living that. That story, mommy. We've, we've done it. Here we are. 30 years later. 21 years ago, I said I do to the love of my life. In this building. We had a reception in this room. Next week, 21 years ago. 15 years ago, we left here. And we went to Michigan. With your blessing. You sent us off and said, go, go, go respond to what you hear God calling you to do. And, and 12 years ago, we started working as minister and chaplain in Southern California. Why do we celebrate anniversaries? Why do we look back? Why do we remember? Why, why do we go back and, and think about where we have come from? The temptation about anniversaries is to spend so much time thinking about what you used to do and who you were that you forget where you're going. So it is good that we celebrate. It is good that we're going to sing, I got the keys. Not I got the keys. We're not doing that, but we're going to sure do My Hope is Built. I got real excited when I saw that one. It's really good to remember uh, who was in which section. Uh, it's really good to see people we haven't seen for a long time. But I challenge you tonight to be careful that you don't get caught up in remembering where we've been, that you forget where we're going. Anniversaries are good. Every year I tell my husband, if you ask me again, I'd say yes. And I don't wait till November. I try to do it more often than that. He's one of the best decisions outside of Jesus that I've ever made. Now, let's be clear that when we celebrate and we remember the past, that we have the uncanny knack, Donovan, of forgetting the negative things. We have a wonderful way of, of kind of overlooking the challenges, Kevin. We, we forget those who have gone before us. I remember when we learned of Rodney. I remember. That was the first major blow for us as young adults in this church. Remember when Abinda got sick? That was the testing ground. Then came Rodney. Then Michelle. We, we can't celebrate without remembering those who are not with us. We can't forget how Brother Kinley used to close the church down on us on a Friday night in this very room. Because he wanted to go home. And at 17, 18, 20, we didn't understand why he was trying to go home on a Friday. I wish somebody would keep me in the church 10 o'clock on a Friday night now. Ain't nobody trying to do that. I'm going home. You, 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 who knows what I'm talking about? All right. It is good to remember the past, but we must be careful that we do not forget the challenges that we face in the past. And we must be careful that we ask questions about what those challenges bring. So often the children of God are wondering, why is this happening to me? Why not you? Why not me? When Paul writes to Timothy, he is writing to him as a prisoner of God. Paul brags about the fact that he's on lockdown because he loves Jesus so much. I wonder if we got locked up today, would it be because of Jesus? Would we be willing to be absent from our families because we are doing the work of God and sharing the good news of salvation with people who are dying without knowing that there is a loving God who sees them in their 
worst condition. It is good to remember the past. It is important that we do not forget the challenges of the past. And I want to spend a little time. When Paul talks to Timothy, he says, listen, there's a spark inside of you. And I don't want you to forget that spark. He says, I know how you got that spark because I laid hands on you. Amen. And he said, as a matter of fact, if you go look at your grandmother and your mama, they both know the God from who this spark has come. And so he says, what I want to do with you, Timothy, is to fan that spark into a flame. Does it mean, Janet Dunham, that sometimes the fire gets really low? And it almost looks like there is nothing left. Paul says to Timothy, that spark can be blown back into a flame. It is necessary. And if you look at the text, he not only says, he says, because the spirit of God is who gives us the spark. It is the spirit of God who blows it into a flame. And there is a purpose for the flame. Linden Church cannot exist for 90 years just because we like to be around and we like to remember what we used to do. Linden Church must exist because it takes seriously the gospel commission. Linden Church must take seriously its gospel commission. We, it, it's good that we fix buildings. It's good that we have choirs. It's good that we have Pathfinders and Adventurers Club. It's, it's good that we have a school, but if the school and the church and the Pathfinders don't get the gospel work done, it just becomes something we celebrate. But it isn't something that enervates and pushes us to complete the work. Sister Epoha, it is so good to see you. I thank God for you. Timothy tells, Paul tells Timothy from the prison, listen, <laughs> valleys are necessary and deserts are even more necessary. We don't preach service sermons about valley experiences and desert experiences. But they are necessary for our development because it is in the valley and in the wilderness and the desert that we learn to stop being self-sufficient and completely dependent on God. Amen. Delroy and I went through some deserts before we left. And they hurt. And they were painful. But I'm glad we had people along the journey who could speak a word of encouragement to us and say to us, you're going to be okay. But you know, the only reason they could tell us is because we told people we were in a valley. We, 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 we specialize in coming to church on Sabbaths like we all living on Bloomfield's Hills. And like everything's all right. Then we get mad when the pastor don't come to visit. Like pastor knew he was in the hospital. Because somebody called him and told him. Or told the elders. Like, so you had an expectation that you didn't share. Because somewhere along the line, we learned that we're not supposed to talk about the negative things. But Paul says to Timothy, boy, I'm in jail. And I'm in jail for the gospel. So it just seems to me that when you and I go through those valleys and those wilderness experiences, it is for the honor and glory of God. And God knows that if he didn't bring you there, notice I said he brought you because we keep giving Satan too much credit. Every time something happens, we blame Satan. If he can be in your house and my house at the same time, Shauna K, we in trouble. Yes. That means he's omnipresent. And the last time I checked, the only one who's omnipresent is Yahweh. Yes. Amen. We go through things because God knows that if he doesn't allow us, if he doesn't lead us into the very valley of the shadow of death, that we won't give up our self-dependence and pride. Why do we celebrate? Because we like to remember where we've come from. We like to look at our accolades and talk about how good we've been. But God wants us to finish what we started. Finish what we started. It's not good enough that our children are doing all right. What about other people's children? Finish what we started. It's not just good enough that we have been able to travel and do things. When are you going to travel for the gospel? It's not good enough that our children get married and have kids. You know, to go to Adventist way, we go to good old Adventist school, go to a good old Adventist church, have a good old Adventist family, and we repeat. And then God allows anomalies to come our way to help us understand that that's not his process. That it's not his plans. Valleys are necessary. Deserts are inevitable. Yet they become the incubator in which we become undone and unmade so that we can truly reflect God's grace. 
Paul says to Timothy, I wish you would read the letters of Paul to Timothy. He says to him, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That's 2 Timothy 1. 2 Timothy 2 verse 1. And that's where I want to land tonight. We know why we celebrate. But I want to challenge us about what, why we should celebrate. We should celebrate so we can catch our second wind. We celebrate so we can catch our second wind. Why do I tell my man of God I would say yes to him again? I say that to him so I can remember that I'm in it to win it. Because on the days when I don't feel like I want to. You still in your honeymoon phase, baby. Mm -hmm. But you, it's coming. Mm -hmm. Even the best of us. Because on those days, Gary, when you like, that woman that the Lord gave me. Not today, Jesus. Right? We remember so that we go, I'm doing it because I want to be here for the long haul. Right? Why do we celebrate church anniversary? So we know that other people caught the vision. The flame was blown into them and they ran their race. And we too must catch our second wind. That's why we celebrate because we have to finish our race tonight i want to end by honoring someone special my mother 30 years ago when i came home and declared i was joining the choir my mom said it was the beginning of the end but it was the beginning of the beginning um i often say that my mother-in-law veronica brooks sometimes must wonder where this girl come from jesus Because she took me in, didn't even know I was going to be her daughter-in-law. And she took me in. And so many of you did. I think of um, Beryl Henry Goodridge, who spoke up for me. So I could go to um, represent the church, and I wasn't even baptized in New Orleans. She spoke up on the board, and she was my chaperone, so I could go to Youth Congress. So many of you, I'm, I'm going to forget names, don't be mad. Janet Denham and Barbara Hall, who took this arrogant young woman defiant, opinionated, and, and try to work with me. And, and, and translated what my mother would tell me. You know, when they told me, I was like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so mommy, you didn't realize that the decision that I made 30 years ago was one that God ordained. Amen. And the example that you set before me was to go to church, read my Bible, and just do the best I could. And so on this 30th anniversary of my decision to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I want to honor you. And I want to say thank you for being faithful. And because of your faithfulness, and as you have been telling me recently, Dillis, you and Jessica made a decision to be obedient to. We couldn't have known a way to go if you had not blown into us the wind till we could catch our own second wind to run our race. So Lyndon, if I never see you again, catch your wind, finish what you started. Tell him, praise the Lord, everybody. This is a conversation that we have often about sticking to time. It did. It did it alarm? Okay. Well, I'm starting mine now. There we go. Praise the Lord, everybody. I'm not going to say anybody's name because I don't remember most of them. I, I just have to be honest about that. But I, I remember your faces and you all look good. Praise the Lord. You look good. Praise the Lord. And my wife gives that story um, about catching the second wind. And that reminds me of uh, another experience that... Uh, I had, I actually, uh, this is 2017, in 2015, I joined, I ran a, a Tough Mudder. It's a 10 point some odd mile obstacle course. And um, I had been exercising a little bit at the time, and so I had gotten excited, joined it with a bunch of other guys, and we went on this thing, man. It was a good time. And, um, but I don't like to run, so I wasn't going to. But as I began uh, moving, there was a, 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 a movement of people going forward. Everybody's going in the same direction. It's this communal event. Everybody's supposed to encourage each other moving forward. And how much did it remind me of what worship ought to be? 
that when we come to worship, it is not a spectator sport. This is about encouraging one another to keep going, get your second win, finish the race. There was an opportunity that I had in the race when I started to feel just a little bit under the weather. The young man who was moving with me, we trying to stay in lockstep with each other. And I said something like, uh, you know what? If we just keep our eyes on the prize, Maureen, you finished a marathon recently. If I would just keep, if you would just think about the end then keep moving, then you recognize as long as we keep putting one foot in front of the other, I can see finished in your future. How often do we have to keep remembering when things aren't going the way we would like to, when the money's not flowing the way we thought it would, when the relationship isn't feeling as good as it did in the beginning. If you would just take a moment and think about this, I see finished in your future. I imagine it would change the whole act atmosphere because now I know what the end is going to be so I don't have to be downtrodden now I got to keep moving forward and I do it under the power of God that's a few moments I wasn't in what I was supposed to be doing so I'm going to ask y'all to jump with me to Mark chapter 9 Mark chapter 9 and this is one of those uh, text stories that you've probably heard before reflected on it's um, it's something that I, I come back to often um, I, I, I say that I cannot be in ministry right now be, without this church. My doctoral dissertation in the introduction, my premise for ministry is this church. And how often we have forgot, I don't know if you recognize this, that when we were coming up, there is a paradigm for youth development, for discipleship, for worship building, for Bible study, already in the way the church works. Because we had four choirs. There was a children's choir. Isn't that right? Children's choir. Then it went to the youth ensemble. Right? Remember that? Then we would go to the Linden Airs. Then there was a church choir. Y'all remember that, right? Y'all still do that here? Hey, oh, okay. Oh, um, all right. Um, well, then this, this is something to get into your, get, start thinking about. Because you cannot stay in the children's choir forever. And there's a certain point you got to move from the children's choir to the young adult choir or the teen choir. Then, then there's a point where you can't be in there no longer, although we tried to stay in there forever. You had to move on to the Linden Airs. And at some point, the Linden Airs and the senior choir started just being the same thing. But it, it, you, there was a movement going on. You understand? There is a maturity that you should be living through as Christians. Are you with me? You can't stay in the children's choir forever. And I think there's far too many Adventists living children's choir lives and people expecting you to be senior choir ministry. You see what I'm saying? You are limiting how far you're supposed to. I'm not supposed to do that part. All right. Mark 9. I'm staying on my, stayed on my time. <laughs> Mark 9. Mark 9. Mark 9. I need y'all to get, get, get with me on this and I'm going to be done. I'm going to be done. Mark 9, starting at verse 14. I'm not going to ask y'all to stand because now I went over, I'm about to go over my time. So, Mark 9, starting at verse 14, it says this. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them. And the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Isn't it curious that in the midst of what, this is at, right after the, uh, the transfiguration of Jesus, he comes down the mountain at the base of the mountain. What is happening is the disciples were um, uh, working with the people. They're blessing people and, and healing people. Yet this man who's brought his child is stuck. Nothing is happening. He brought his child to the church, if you believe, if you will. And nothing happened. He, he brought his boy who had been suffering for years to the people of God. And that thing, nothing took place. How many people come into worship the same way? Or rather leave this worship the same way they came in? 
How many times are you going, I just need a word, and what you got was somebody telling you something that you didn't need? The, 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 the issue in the text is the man says, Jesus, I brought my son to you, but your disciples. At what point did bringing your things to Jesus get shifted to handing it to other people? I would dare say we have this, this awful habit of expecting people to do things that only God can do. You're looking for that man to give you fulfillment that you were supposed to find in Jesus. You're looking for that job to offer you validation that you were supposed to find in Jesus. You are looking for other people to give you what can only be found in Jesus. And because you didn't get it, now you're going to go on strike from God. God, you did that to me. God didn't do that to you. You did that to you. My wife just made mention of going into the valleys and, and, and being in the desert. One of the, I would like to think, hallmarks of our ministry is that we have learned right here that we, it does not benefit us to fake the funk when it comes to our faith. If I don't know it, bruh, I don't know. Why God? Got me. I don't know it. But if you like, why don't we get into this word together and let's find out what God has to say. I think we've, we've, we've misrepresented God so often because when people have brought their things to Jesus, his people have failed. And the reason you failed is because you're not spending any time praying for the people before they get here. Are you praying for the wanderer? Are you praying for the stranger? Every Sabbath, I count it a blessing that somebody stumbles into my church and says that they're a visitor. Because I'm knocked out by that. I'm like, wow, God, you would impress upon this person to walk into this church at this time. That you would bless us to be able to be a, a, a place where this person would be able to hear about the life-giving power of Jesus. So, when I come to die, give me Jesus. When I wake up in the morning, give me Jesus. Don't, don't add all your extra to it. Just give me who Jesus is. And the thing is, the lovely thing about how Jesus can work himself into the life of the believer is that it changes. He changes how we speak to each other. You've, you've all heard the saying of, um, uh, uh, you know, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. How, how powerful is that? Because so many of us think we got to be, if I'm not explaining out all of my 28 fundamentals to this person who ain't never even opened a Bible before, I've just failed God. No, no, you haven't. What you are supposed to do is show them what God looks like. But far too many of us don't know what God looks like ourselves. Because we've wrapped up God in doctrinal thoughts, in opinion pieces, in GC mandates. I'm from California, so... <laughs> we hear... <laughs> In California, I claim New York, but I'm in New York, so now I'm in California. So. <laughs> and, and the challenge that we have is that you got people all around you that need to hear from you in your way, with your gifts, who Jesus is. Jesus is in the smile of a Sabbath school teacher that I had here. 
that I see right over there. Amen. Yeah, you're looking around. I'm looking right at you. That's where I saw Jesus. I saw Jesus in Tony Hall doing everything wrong. But he had the ministry of presence. There is not one teen young man when I was coming up that didn't spend time with Tony on a job, in his van, at the McDonald's, at a basketball game. <laughs> I saw Jesus and a pastor named Roy Ashmead that when we were doing a church cleanup i happened to stumble down here and he had the big uh buffer machine out to clean the floor and i looked at him and i was like pastor ashmead what are you doing and he was like i used to work um what does it call it sanitation or not sanitation where you work when you clean up what do you call it janet janitorial when he was in jamaica custodial there you go so he knew how to work the machine and I had never seen a pastor do that I'd never seen a pastor put his hands to work I had grown up with an idea of what pastors do so it was very hard for me to even accept the title of pastor because I was like I ain't that back to back to our text I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You all know the rest. It goes, you unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When, Jesus saw, when, he, when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. Now, this is a word for people who've been waiting for a long time for God to do something. My wife said, we've been living in California for 12 years. Eight of those years, I was employed by a church, but not my conference. And I kept going, I'm going, we, this is going to work out at some point. It's going to work out at some point, Pastor Lamar. It was going to work out at some point. And I came to a point, a rest about year seven, where I wasn't going to wait no longer, Pastor. I said, forget them. Forget y'all, your church, and all that stuff. Maybe God is calling me to just challenge me and make me go into the, the public sector. I'm going to go work for a nonprofit because I can't stand this church people and their politics. <laughs> Told my pastor at the time that I was going to quit ministry altogether. Thought maybe God was leading me in a different direction. You know, you, you know we get pious when we don't understand what God is going to do next. So perhaps God is leading me in another direction. And my pastor told me, no, don't do that. He said, man, talk to an accountability person. Pray on it. Why don't you fast? Took the next 30 days to fast, pastor. On day 27, the VP of Black Ministries of our conference called me and said he had a church that he wanted to send me to. This is in the meantime, I was working on my dissertation, Sean K, and I was not in my right mind a lot. Maybe that had something to do with it. Oh, I'm done. So I'll sit down now. No. I went over. I'm sorry. I got to finish the story now. So I can't rebuke my wife. So because I just went over. Day 27, guy calls me up and says, he, he says, a church they want to send me to, um, and they're going to hire me full time into the conference. Yay, praise the Lord. At the same time as he says that, he says, and we're going to have you ordained in the summer. So now I had been there for now eight years at the time we were having this conversation. Eight years. No recognition. In a matter of 30 days, less than 30, in a conversation in a week, I was at a new church on an ordination track, which also it, 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 it did something to my money. Praise Jesus. Amen. 
Yes, and we graduated with our doctorate that summer, got ordained that summer. That the, 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 the idea or the thought process has always been to me that I remember. That people may not always be there to give you what you think you're supposed to have at the time you think you're supposed to have it. But God is faithful. If you would just stick to him, if you would just be faithful, just remain faithful. See, the issue with these disciples is that they, they didn't prepare for what God had needed for them to do. So this is why Jesus comes out and is like, man, y'all ain't even got faith for this. What about what comes next? I challenge you. Where is your faith? Where have you been practicing your faith? Faith. And how do people see Jesus in you? God bless you. I'm going to sit. I got to tag out. Tagging you in, bro. <laughs> okay. Looks like I'm part of the tag team. I'm part of the tag team. Dillis got up here first. You know, like when... When, when, when I greeted you, I, I, I said, who is this? You greeted me like you knew me, but I couldn't remember you. And then when Shauna Tay, Shauna Kay started talking, I said, that's who's sitting behind me, those two people. That's who's it. So California, you know, California, when we had Oakwood College, a lot of the California girls were tall. It looked like y'all just got tall since you've been in California. Well, I want you to tell you, I had a call to go to California at least twice. And I was having so much a good time in Northeastern. I just turned them down. I'm telling you, I've enjoyed my last 45 years here. Yeah, right here in Northeastern, started interning at the Bethel Church. And I ain't sorry. I mean, I, I, California is nice. That, that's some nice stuff over there. I mean, Ellen White even went to California. You know, she lived there for a while. But I want to congratulate you for the 90, well, praise God with you for the 90 years of service to this community. And the patriarchs whose shoulders you stand on, your forefathers, and I just want to say that what I want to say to you tonight is for future. Because I think this message will be appropriate because you're going to be going back up there. And there's being, going to be a different expectation when you go back up there. Different expectation. Like you said, you can't stay in the children's choir forever. You got to grow. So I want to preach to you tonight. Something that's going to help you grow. So bow your heads with me and let me pray like I used to pray. Father in heaven, help us. Open our hearts and make our hearts fertile ground where the seed can take root and grow magnificently through the power of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, amen. The house of God, the gate of heaven the house of God the gate of heaven you take your Bible and we look at Hebrews chapter 11 I'm looking at my time okay good that'll help me to know how to how to move my steps uh, I, I wish I had one of these <laughs> to, to hold this I don't like holding these uh, I need both hands to turn to my Bible uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and I want you to look at verse 27 about Moses. It says, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. When we come to worship God at church, And in our life at home and at work, we need to be seeing God who is invisible. Okay, that's, that's how Moses did it. He saw God who was invisible. Now, Ephesians chapter 3, go over there. 
and then I'm going to run. Go over to Ephesians chapter 3 and look at verse 20 and 21. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can think or ask according to the power that works in us. That's the power of faith, my friends. To him be glory to the church. This part, this one I like so much. To him be glory to the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. To him be glory in the church through all ages, world without end. In other words, my friends, the church is forever. If you thought the church was just some temporary thing for down here, no, the church is forever. So if you want to be forever, stay in the church and get to know the man of the house, which is Jesus. And now my final text. My final text is 1 Timothy chapter 4, and I want you to look at verse 13. This is the text that starts by telling young people, don't let nobody despise your youth, but be an example to the believers, and so forth and so on. But then he said this. I want you to get this now. This is very important, because as I share this with you tonight, this is very important. Paul says, until I come, makes you think about the second coming of Jesus. He says, until I come, there's three things I want you to do. Read, exhort, and <laughs> what's, the, what's the third thing? Do you see it? And give attention to the doctrine. Some people like to hate that word, but so instead of using the word doctrine, use the word teachings. The teachings of Jesus. You see them as he walks through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The teachings. Do those three things. Read, exhort, encourage your brethren. Encourage people that are even not your brethren. And stick to the doctrine. Give attention to it. He says take heed to it and tell others about it. And then maybe you'll save yourself and those that hear you. So I came to tell you tonight, this is a very special place, Linden. I'm glad you're down here because you're going to be going up there. Ellen White, she was called, I always talk about Ellen White like this, Ellen White was called when she was 17, which means God believes in young people. Oh, young people got to remember that. Whenever you hear Ellen White, don't turn your face. She was a teenager when she got started. That's who got, he didn't call some old lady. He called a young woman, a teenager. And during her lifetime of ministry that lasted 70 years, she wrote by hand approximately 25 million words that ended up being on 100,000 sheets. And I say this to you, Adventist people, because he said the Bible, he told Timothy, Paul told Timothy, read, exhort, stick to the doctrine. Do not think that God inspired this little girl that became an old woman to do all that writing and we're not supposed to read it. And we're not supposed to read it. Adventists, if you're going to be a good Seventh-day Adventist Christian, you better read. Because if you don't read, you'll be ignorant and you'll be doing ignorant things. The house of God, look, I want you tonight to see the church in a different way. Especially that you're getting it all fixed up. The house of God, that is the gate of heaven. So that when I'm coming to church on Sabbath morning to worship God, I'm in a whole new atmosphere. I'm not in this world anymore. It's almost like I, I, I warped into another world. <laughs> I'm not in the world. I, 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 the, I'm at the gate of heaven itself. Volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 491 up to 500. Take your time to read it. I'm just going to share, share with you some important points from that. She says on page 491, I'm going to start there. She says, to the humble, believing soul, the house of God on earth is the gate of heaven. The songs of praise, there it is. 
the prayer, that's, that's an important ingredient in worship, and the word spoken by Christ's representatives are God's appointed agencies to prepare a people for the church above. You see, the church is not going to finish. This is not just an earthly thing. We're going to still have church up there. For that loftier worship, notice, the loftier worship into which there can enter nothing that defileth, which means we really got to be converted to get up there. We got to be transformed. We got to be changed. We're not going just like we are. From the sacredness which was attached to the earthly sanctuary, Christians may learn how they should regard the place where the Lord meets with his people. The Lord actually meeting with us. And I'm going to tell you, it's dangerous to come to church today. I mean, that guy down in South Carolina, he went to that prayer meeting and shot those people up like that. And then that other crazy guy went and shot those 50s, shot up those people in Texas. It's dangerous coming to church today. But I'm going to tell you, I'm coming. You know why I'm coming? Because he promised to be here. I'm not going to worry about bullets. Because I got a super Jesus here. Is that all right? There has been a great change, the Spirit says, not for the better, but for the worse, in the habits and customs of the people in reference to a religious, to, to religious worship. The precious, the sacred things which connect us with God are fast losing their hold upon our minds and hearts and are being brought down to a level of common things. The reverence for the sanctuary has largely passed away. I got to do a funeral Sunday. They called me to tell me, Sister So-and-so, pass away. She's saying here that reverence in the sanctuary where we Adventist worship largely passed away. Which means there's a little bit left. There's a little bit of left. For, a little bit left. Dr. Richards, good to see you. I was wondering where the pastor was. There he is smiling. All right, I'm glad to see you. The house. Watch this, because... Our religion starts at the house. The house is the sanctuary of the family. The closet or the grove, the most retired place for individual worship. But the church, yes, Linden, the church is the sanctuary for the congregation. And there should be rules in regard to the time and the place and the manner of worshiping. Nothing that is sacred, nothing that pertains to the worship of God should be treated with carelessness or indifference. Y'all got that? Now watch this. This is what I like about God. This is what I like about God. He's just not for the high. He's for the low as well. He says, happy are those who have a sanctuary, be it high or low, in the city or on the mountains, in the caves, uh, in the cabin, or in the wilderness, if it is the best that they can secure for the master, if that's the best they can do, he will hallow the place with his presence, and it will be holy unto the Lord of hosts. What a God we serve. He not, not only just deals with the high people, he deals with the low ones too. He's not a respecter of persons. So number one, there's seven things I want to share with you. Number one is this. I'm going to take you through the worship service as Ellen White was shown by the Spirit. Watch this. Number one, when the worshipers enter the place of meeting, they should do so with decorum, passing quietly to their seats. If there is a stove in the room, it is not proper to crowd about it in indolence and careless attitudes. She says, common talking, whispering, laughing should not be permitted in the house of worship either before or after before or after ardent active piety should characterize the worshipers I don't you remember I came out of a Methodist church to join this church and I was surprised at how even in Buffalo how fluid we were with walking around while service was going on we would never do that in the Methodist church never if some have to wait for a few minutes before the meeting begins, let them maintain a true spirit of devotion by silent meditation, which we don't know nothing about it, 
keeping the heart uplifted to God in prayer that the service may be a special benefit to their own hearts and lead and convict others to be converted. They should remember that heavenly messengers are in the house. When you read in Daniel chapter 4, it says the watchers were watching Nebuchadnezzar. And he's not even in the church. Don't you think he's watching us? We're being watched, each one of us individually. The text goes on, she says, we lose much sweet communion with God by our restlessness. By not encouraging moments of reflection and prayer. You know we what we come to do in the Adventist church? Because people don't know nothing about this. We do song service until service starts because we don't have a song service. They'll just be talking and carrying on. They won't even be preparing their hearts for the service at all. We need to learn how to do that. Amen. It may seem strange to you, but we need to learn it. The spiritual condition needs to be often reviewed and the mind and the heart drawn towards the son of righteousness. If when the people come into the house of worship, they have a genuine reverence for the Lord and bear in mind that they are in his actual presence, there will be a sweet eloquence in silence. Do you know sometimes, some people, silence kills them. Have you ever went home and because it was so, you had to turn the TV already on because you're scared of silence. You're scared of silence. You think something's coming for you. Well, it's the Holy Ghost coming for you. Let them get you. Amen. The whispering and laughing and talking, which might be without sin in the common business place, should find no sanction in the house of God where he is worshipped. The mind should be prepared to hear the word that it may have due weight and suitably, suitably impress the heart. So when you walk into the church, I used to make Catholics. They say Catholics make good Adventists. Catholics come into this church and they do that little kneel thing. You see them do that. You come to come on Catholics, they come, they kneel, and then they sit down and be quiet. And they're waiting for the service to start. Number two, here's number two. You're walking through the service. Ellen White, the spirit says, when the minister enters, it should be with dignified, solemn men. He should bow down in silent prayer as soon as he steps into the pulpit and earnestly ask help of God. She says, what an impression this will make. There will be a, a solemnity and awe upon the people. And sometimes I wonder, you know, when you do that, you, you, you've seen it in the Adventist church. We, the ministers come in and they kneel right away. You've seen that, right? Yes, that's what they do. All right. He's committing himself to God before he dares to stand before the people. And I tell you, to stand before the people to preach, that's a daring thing to do. Especially if you're going to say something that may challenge them to grow a little bit more. Text says, every one of the congregation also who fears God should be with bowed heads, unite in silent prayer with him, that the grace of God may come into the meeting and give power to what he has to say. Number three, when the meeting is opened by prayer, watch this one, this is going to really get you. When the meeting is opened by prayer, every knee should bow in the presence of the Holy One. And every heart should ascend to God in silent devotion. Now, I'm going to tell you, when we do the invocation, I remember trying to do that one time. I, they were sent me to a church one time, and this is a big church. And, uh, and, and, I, and, and in the invocation came, and I said, I said, I said, let's kneel for the invocation. Oh, man. People didn't like that at all. They're not used to that. Like, for instance, we like to clap in church, but we won't lift up our hands and bless them. You know, the Bible says lift up your hands in the sanctuary, right? We'd rather clap, but clap is for humans. Lifting up your hands, oh, now that's for God. Because you're reaching up just like a child when he wants his mama. What does he do? He reaches up like that. And what does he want you to do? Pick me up. That's what I try to tell my people. You do that. When you're in church, do that. Because you're asking God. You're not only blessing it. Yeah, pick me up and carry me in your arms. Help me feel secure because I'm getting a lot of trouble in my life. That's, we're in number three. So he says, 
That's what happens. They, and we kneel. The prayer of the faithful worshiper will be heard and the ministry of the word will prove effectual. But you know, we miss this point, then we're missing something in service. If we miss this point. The, then, then she talks about attitude of church members. When you come in, you got to have a good attitude. So we have a good altitude. And at the end, have a good latitude to reach people, right? The lifeless attitude of the worshipers in the house of God is one great reason why the ministry is not more productive of good. When we come in here, we need to be actively worshiping. It's not just noise. But we got to combine it with silence. It's, a, it's, a, it's an orchestra. You know, there's loudness and then there's silence. And there's loudness and then there's silence. <laughs> Number four. When the word of is spoken. Oh, everybody's waiting on that. When the word is spoken, you should remember, brethren, that you are listening to the voice of God through his delegated servant. I like it when we end the service. There's that song that they sing at my church. It says, let the church say amen, right? Let the church say amen. God has spoken, right? Let the church say amen. Isn't that what they say? Ah, uh, but sometimes you wonder if they really believe that God has spoken because you said something they didn't like. Something that would have made them grow a little bit. We got to be growing in the church. We got to always be growing. What does the text say over there? And in, in, I think it's in Peter. Second Peter says, add to your faith, virtue to your virtue, knowledge to your knowledge, temperance to temperance, patience to patience, godliness. You know, you got to get the godliness first because then godliness helps you to love, give brotherly kindness to your brother. And then if you can do that, then the crown of your life is love. You've reached it. What is God? The essence of God is this. God is love. That is his essence. And that is powerful. Song of Solomon says it's more powerful than death itself. And that it can't be quenched by floods or drowned. Talk about love, my dear friends. That's why marriage is so important. Because in marriage... In marriage, you got to hang in there because it gets tough. In marriage, it gets tough. That girl you walk down the aisle with won't be the same girl 10 years from now or 20 years from now. She will have grown in so many different ways that you had not imagined that she would grow that way. I'm not talking about weight and all of that, but that doesn't matter. Shucks, my wife does not weigh what she weighed when I married her, but that's my wife. Gave me three kids. I'm going to be there. Amen. So, so when the word is spoken, number four, it says, listen attentively. Sleep not for one instant, because by this slumber, you may lose the very words that you need most. The very words which, if heeded, would save your feet from straying into the wrong path. Satan and his angels, she says, are busy creating paralysis, paralysis a, a paralyzed condition of the senses so that Cautions, warnings, reproof shall be not heard. He doesn't want you to hear. That's what I love about Friday night. I love Friday nights. See, Friday nights, when we were in Buffalo, we used to go to choir rehearsal on Friday night, and then we'd go home and go to sleep. It's the wrong time to try to catch up on that Sabbath school lesson. It'll keep you up all night. If you didn't do that Sabbath school lesson a little bit... <laughs> Try to do that Sabbath school lesson all, five, all seven days on Friday night. You will not go to bed. Friday night was designed for you and me to get some sleep. Because we've been working all week. You need some sleep. Because the Lord, when you come here on Sabbath morning to worship the Lord in Sabbath school and, and church, you are not to be sleeping then. Sleep on Friday night. And if it's messing you up, then maybe you can't be in the choir then because some people can handle the choir and go home and sleep right there and wake up and, and come and worship God. Connect with God who is real. Thank God for Friday night. The Lord knew what he was doing when he planned the Sabbath. She said sometimes a little child may, may uh, uh, attract attention to the hearers and, and, and keep pressing seed from falling on good ground. You people with kids... Get them out of there if you can't get them to quiet. Get them out of there and then come right back. That's all. Don't have people wondering, when is she going to make that child be quiet? No, that's your responsibility, mom or dad. Child can't be quiet. You can't get them quiet. He's distracting the gospel seed from being planted in somebody's heart. Get up, 
go back there. As a matter of fact, you ought to start in the children's room. And, and every church ought to have a children's room, right? Where the mothers can take care of those kids. All right, that's number four. Number five. Yes, go to number five. I told you it's only seven. I love seven. So here's number five. Here's number five. Number five. When the benediction is pronounced. Oh, people love the benediction part. So it's finally over. <laughs> so when the benediction is pronounced, watch this. All should still be quiet. As fearful of losing the peace of Christ. Let all pass out without jostling and loud talking. Feeling that they are in the very presence of God. That his eye is resting upon them. That they must act as, as, as in his invisible presence. Now, I'm going to tell you, God is here. You cannot see the air, but you're breathing it. You cannot see your brain, but you're thinking and you're working. These things that you cannot see, they do exist. God exists. Let there be no stopping in the aisles to visit or gossip, thus blocking them up so others can't pass through. The precinct of the church should be invested with a sacred reverence. It should not be made a place to meet old friends and visit and introduce common thoughts and worldly business transactions. These should be left outside the church. That's why it's good to have a nice lobby. Oh, the great temptation. If you have a nice big church and you didn't plan when you're building the church to build a lobby so that when the service is over, the people can get out of there. Get out of the presence of the Lord and be reverent. But don't make after the service is over, make it a big old, big old social meeting after. That's irreverent. Did you know that? Ah, oh, but let's go on. Talking about growing people. It should not be made a place to meet old friends and visit and introduce common. God and angels have been dishonored by the careless, noisy, laughing and shuffling of the feet heard in some places. Now remember what she said. Laughing and talking in outside is not a sinful thing but when you're in church in God's presence and you just heard the message you need to get out and the beautiful thing about this church is when you finish up there you can come right down here all this room and you can just greet each other carry on knock yourself out but up there holy amen up there holy up there reverence you, I mean, you got you to learn this it's got to become part of yourself others may not be doing it but you can do it for yourself because God is going to judge you based on what you did, not what you saw others doing. Be careful of watching what others are doing. You better watch what Jesus is doing. You better listen to the word. You better, like, like Paul said, until I come, read, exhort, and stick to the doctrine. Was that number five? Here's number six. Number six is shorter. Number, here's number six. Number six sounds like something I said in the beginning, but I got to say it. She said, volume five of the testimonies, page 493, 495, 495, 496. It is too true that reverence for the house of God has become almost extinct. You know that word extinct means? It means to disappear forever. Can that happen in God's house? Watch this. Sacred things and places are not discerned. The holy and exalted are not appreciated. Do you know what Ellen White calls prayer meeting? Because God is there too. She calls prayer meeting a social meeting. Yeah, it's called a social meeting. As a matter of fact, at prayer meeting, I don't try to jazz prayer meeting up. You know, people say, you want to jazz it up, get the people to come out. No, people need to come to prayer meeting to meet the Lord and to be with his people. We come together to testify. We need to thank God for his goodness and tell what he's done in our lives. We got to do that. And we got to, we got to pray for each other. That's right. That's what we, we pray. it's called prayer meeting. It's not even called preaching meeting, even though preaching goes on. But when I go to prayer meeting, I preach a little short message, maybe 10 minutes. I, that's it. You said, well, pastor, why are you not doing that now? <laughs> no, 
I'm doing. I, I got number seven coming, right? So you know I'm almost finished. All right, and 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 y'all not my church, <laughs> and I don't know how in the world I got invited here. I don't even understand why y'all invited me here to come behind the home girl and the home boy. So I feel it a privilege, Shana K, that they even invited me. I don't even know why I'm here. I, I never passed in this church. I never grew up here. My sister was here now. Maybe that's it, Zandra. Zandra was here. Y'all know Zandra? Zandra was here. Oh, she loved Lyndon. She, she down in Alabama now. Number six says, no, 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 I, I'm just repeating. I, I'm not, wait, wait. I'm just saying number six says, number six says, it's almost extinct. We want to make sure that Lyndon, that that doesn't happen. When we go back up there, that doesn't happen. And here's number seven. I like seven because Revelation is full of sevens. So I like seven. Here's seven. Because of the irreverence. And this, this one thing is a whole sermon in itself. Because of irreverence in attitude. Watch this. Dress. <laughs> and deportment. And lack of worshipful frame of mind. You know, some people will criticize a sermon because they didn't get nothing out of it. But if they didn't come with the right frame of mind, no wonder they missed it. No wonder they missed it. They didn't come with the proper frame of mind. When you come to worship God, come into his presence, you got to come with a certain frame of mind. That's why you, you can't be worrying about your job or your business or your bills or your nasty husband that you have to deal with. That you shouldn't have married, but you married him anyway. You didn't hold out until he got baptized. You, you just went on and married him, and then he walked on to church. Don't be thinking about that stuff. When you come to church, come with the right frame of mind. Just focus on Jesus. That's it. So that when you leave, you will know that God can do anything for you. From somewhere out of nowhere, he will bless you because God don't need no resources. He can just say something for you, will it for you, and it is yours. He depends on nothing. So when you pray, you expect God to do something. So you come to the church, it says, God, now this is one I want you to miss. I, I want to end on that. This number seven says, God has often turned his face away from those assembled for his worship. Now that's some strange stuff right there. You can be singing hallelujah, praise the Lord, and carrying on and being irreverent and think God is in here. They could be playing that organ and the bass of that organ, get your body going, and you think the spirit is there. But God been left long ago. He left early. Because he wasn't honored. I'm at Elmont Temple now in my 45th year. I didn't learn everything I was supposed to learn in ministry. I had to learn it piecemeal. And that's where it is to become a Christian. The Christian journey is a lifetime journey. And you're always adding, subtracting, and dividing. But what God is doing for you and my, me is this. He's multiplying. Paul says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you. So God multiplies grace because where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. So I need God to multiply on me. And while he's multiplying on me, I am adding to my faith virtue, to my virtue knowledge, to my knowledge, what I call the TPG. Temperance, patience, godliness, and then the rest. And then I got to subtract all the ugly things that are not like Christ. I got to subtract that. Filthy language, I got to subtract that. Evil thoughts, I got to subtract that. Backbiting, I got to subtract that. Hating on people, I got to subtract that. Gossip, I got to subtract that. And then I got to divide. And what is division? I can't serve two masters. No more than a man in America can have two women for a wife, legally speaking. He said you're either going to hate one and stick to the other, but you can't serve two. You must divide. Amen? You've got to divide. 
and serve God rather than mammon. And so I end with these words to my Adventist friends. You know, I, I, I know, is there a vis any visitors in here that would like to give their heart to Jesus? I'm just going to ask that. Just raise your hand. If you, you're a visitor, you've been coming to this church all the time, you know these people, and you've been thinking about it, but you didn't do it, but you came here tonight. Again, I came again. You didn't wait till Sabbath. You came tonight. Is there anybody here that wants to give their heart to Jesus that's like that and join the Linden Church family? Anybody like that? I just want to make sure I asked. Praise the Lord. I ask. I tell people about the appeal. The appeal is simply this. Ask the question. And then wait for the response. And so these are the words that I want to end with. I want to end with the Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22. After speaking to you 30 minutes. Delroy gave it to me at 5 minutes to 9. I finished with these words. Revelation chapter 3 verse 22. These are the words of Jesus in Revelation. Jesus says this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. We want to thank our ministers this evening. We're going to ask the deacons if they would go to the door. Amen. Wait at the door. And as our saints are tipping out, have them to just drop their offering right there at the door. So thank you very much, uh, Deacon. And your second deacon is going to be at the door too. Deacon, hold the, hold the basket out so they know that that's where their offering is. Praise the Lord. Amen. If you hold it upright, they, they just think you're just holding it. But, but lay it down flat, brother. Yes, Deacon Johnson. Amen. So they know to just drop the... Amen. Church, we're going to invite the shepherd of this flock, Pastor Dr. Warner Richards, if he would come up. We're going to invite you to stand as we offer the benediction. Just a few housekeeping notes. Um, Friday we meet again. Amen. And we will be blessed by the Linden Ensemble for Christ Reunion Choir. Hallelujah. Amen. You all see Delcia here. Amen. See Sister Karen here. Amen. Another choir members, Carolyn Brooks also, Jessica. We've been seeing some Queens Mass Choir members, the Mitchells, amen, hallelujah. So we want you to come back out, the Reunion Choir on Friday night, and the Reunion Choir will also minister Sabbath for the worship service and then in concert again on Sabbath evening. People are traveling from all over the country. We're so excited and we want to share that with you. So we look forward to seeing you. So to that end, choir members, reunion choir members who are here, after the benediction, if you would just come and meet us right up front here. I won't keep you long, but you know we still have a little polishing to do. Praise the Lord. So we're going to ask Pastor Richards. Pastor Richards, how, how do you want us to refer to you? Okay. So, Pastor Richards, <laughs> um, you know, having gone through that road a little bit before him, you know, sometimes, and I'm the same way. Just call me Shauna Kay. <laughs> Amen. I'll answer. Um, but we just want to make sure we respect it how you prefer to be addressed. So, Pastor Richards will give us the benediction and whatever other instructions you have for us. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, beloved, I just want to remind us all that uh, uh, before that, I just want to thank uh, pastors Brooks and pastor Lamar for coming out and blessing us with the word tonight uh, tonight has been a night of praise been a night of worship and uh, instruction in the word and we praise God for that uh, we want to just remind everyone that uh, we are having a banquet celebration did you know that and the 26 even the word says that when we get to heaven, we are going to have a big grand celebration. And, uh, and the Lord is going to host that party. Uh, what we have as parties down here is a perversion of what God has in perfection. So we want to rehearse that grand reunion in that celebration. 
and uh there is yes there is a price but there's some folks who have expressed challenge uh to say well maybe i can't meet the price look don't you be worried and discouraged if you have a challenge come talk to us we can work something out because jesus paid it all right so all to him we owe so don't be shy we are a family don't don't do like me when i was in the in the fourth grade i heard my parents having a grown-up conversation about that they didn't have money and there was a trip at school and i told myself that my parents had no money to send me on the trip and i didn't tell them anything about the trip and i did not go on the trip and all my peers they went to there was a children's park and they had such a great time they told me all these stories and then at a parent teachers conference the teacher expressed to my mom how hurt she was that i didn't go with the other children to the children's park and that's such a good time and she said i warren why didn't you tell me if you had told me i would have sent you i have been traumatized ever since because now i can't go to the children's park because i'm grown now and i missed it so make sure you don't miss that say something talk to somebody talk to me you can talk to sister don burrell you can talk to sister carol bennett you can talk to who else sister cheryl taylor you can talk to elder palmer we can work something out amen so let us pray father we are so thankful for what you have gifted us tonight through your servants and through your presence here with us as we leave this place we ask oh father that you take us take us in safety take us in your care and bring us back on friday evening and then on sabbath morning again to celebrate as we hear from dr dr allen martin as he comes back and share with us the word and father prepare our hearts so that in the grand celebration the one that really means something when this earth shall be no more we pray father that no one here under the sound of my voice be missing from that grand reunion for we ask it in jesus mighty name amen have a good night everyone god bless you Get home safely. My 90th anniversary, folks. Remember, we have a little, a little meeting. I'll meet you in the back.